Um, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Um, obviously, the most topical question is the ICJ interim ruling. What do you make of it? I think it's a great achievement, regardless of the fact that the court did not do what we were hoping for, which is to call for an immediate ceasefire, an immediate permanent ceasefire. Nevertheless, I think uh, what the court decided, uh, which is to accept the case of, uh, uh, that is accusing Israel of committing genocide, is, uh, is a huge achievement and a huge change in the situation because it means that Israel for the first time in nine, in, since 1948, for 75 years, uh, for the first time Israel is now uh, has lost its impunity, the same impunity that was granted to her by the United States of America, by Western governments, that allowed Israel to be totally impunitive to international law and uh, to international uh, criminal courts. Uh, this is the first time they will be judged in the court of justice. And uh, they are now accused. They are now accused of genocide. That is a very big achievement. It will open the door wide uh, for uh, initiating uh, boycott divestment sanctions against Israel, uh, not only for committing genocide, but also for being a persistent uh, uh, producer of a system of apartheid and racism against the Palestinian people, and for sustaining the longest military occupation in modern history. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what the court decided, like the six points that the court uh, declared or uh, ruled, uh, are very important, including prevention of genocide, uh, uh, not allowing uh, advocacy of genocide, uh, allowing people to receive humanitarian aid so that they would not die, uh, not allowing people who were evicted to go back to the places they were evicted from. All of this will not be able Israel will not be able to implement any of these rulings without permanent ceasefire. And that's why the natural step that was followed is the Algerian decision to go to the Security Council of the United Nations to demand a ceasefire. Because that is usually the duty of the uh, UN agencies or the international organization that have executive power. The court does not have executive power, but it has the moral power and it has the legal power, and they've done that. So now it is the duty of those in the United Nations to implement uh, what the court decided by imposing a ceasefire on Israel. We'll see what the United States will do, but that's an opening of a whole new chapter, uh, a very important chapter. And as I said, this also opened the door for a huge grassroots sanctions movement on Israel. Um, you brought me to ceasefire, which was my next question. I just wondered, you know, you mentioned Algeria going to the UN Security Council either last night or this morning. Um, there's also in Paris, we have the Qataris, the Americans, the Egyptians, and the Israelis now discussing uh, a potential ceasefire. What do you think are the prospects that this will actually come about, that there will be a ceasefire? Well, it depends on many factors, but uh, so far Israel has failed drastically in achieving any of its, of its four goals. They failed uh, to destroy the resistance, the Palestinian resistance. They failed to impose their occupation in the places where their tanks uh, is stationed. They failed uh, in bringing back their hostages, as they call them, without exchange with of prisoners, with Palestinians. And they failed to conduct ethnic cleansing, which was the main goal of this Israeli operation, because we have to put what happened in Gaza in the historical context of the struggle of the Palestinian people. The main issue here is that Palestinians, regardless of the fact that 7 million of them are refugees, displaced, and not allowed to come home, regardless of that, and regardless of the ethnic cleansing that happened 75 years ago, our numbers in the occupied territories and in, in Palestine in 1948 areas is bigger than the Israeli Jewish people. And so when Israel attacked Gaza in this vicious manner, uh, their main goal was really to conduct ethnic cleansing because they have to find, I mean, the only three possible solutions are either two-state solution which Israel is refusing and which cannot be happening without ending the whole Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories. Or a one-state solution, which also Israel is adamantly against, because a one-democratic state means it would not be a Jewish-only state. 
So the third option that they are opting for is ethnic cleansing. And the very, I mean, very, it's very important to note that uh, Netanyahu, in the very first days of this uh, attack on Gaza, declared that his goal is to evict everybody from Gaza. And his military spokesperson, Richard Hecht, spoke about evicting every Gazan from their homes into Sinai openly and bluntly. They failed to achieve that. So the main goal of the Israeli operation is failing. Their hope was they will evict the people of Gaza and then come to the West Bank and evict the people of, Gaza, of the West Bank. Now they failed in achieving all of that. So this is a war without goals now, except killing the poor Palestinian civilians. Almost 32,000 of them up till now, including those under the rubble. 64,000 injured, many of whom will die. It's a horrible thing, 4% of the population. So there is a pressure from within even Israel about how far we can go. Why? Because Israel is also suffering from three other factors. First of all, they're losing people, they're military people, and they are, uh, the, the human losses that they are having is something that Israel cannot tolerate. It's a very long war for Israel. It's unprecedented, and they are failing to achieve their goals. Third, they are having a very serious economic crisis. And Israel is at the edge, probably, of an economic collapse. The talks is that they are losing around $62 billion uh, in this war. So all these are factors that are affecting them, plus, of course, the moral factor where Israel is isolated now with the United States worldwide. So these are factors to have ceasefire. What is the opposite factor? Is the fact that Israel is a fascist government. And there are fascists there like Smotrich and Bingvir who don't want to stop the war. And most important, the prime minister in this fascist government, Netanyahu, does not want to stop the war because it means at the end of his political career. And more than that, it could mean him going to, 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 to prison, to jail. Uh, he, is, he knows very well, once the war is over, next morning, the investigation committees will accuse him of failure on the 7th of October. They will accuse him of failing in running this war. And uh, he will have to meet the fact that there are four cases of corruption against him. Yesterday, he asked the court one more time to delay and postpone his uh, case. So he, he, four cases of corruption most probably will send him to jail. So this man is ready to kill his mother to stay in power. And he's ready to kill any number of Palestinians to continue the war. He's even, I would dare to say, he's ready to even escalate the situation to a full-scale war with Lebanon just to stay in power and, and hope for a miracle that will, uh, will, will keep him in, 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 a bit, in, in a position of a prime minister. So these are the different factors. Then comes the United States, of course, as a factor. What will they do? That's the big question. You have Blinken, who's really behaving as an Israeli foreign minister rather than an American foreign minister. And you have a strong tendency of support to Israel. We've heard them yesterday saying that the ICJ confirms the right of Israel to defend itself, as they say. So, so rubbish, by the way. And uh, on the other hand, the United States is losing a lot in the region, is losing a lot worldwide. Uh, they know very well that what's happening is the decline of any respect of international law if Israel is allowed to continue this war. And this will cost them a lot in their confrontation with China, with Russia, with, with other countries. Another important factor is Biden. Biden entered this war hoping it will guarantee his re-election. He's now going to pay the price of not being elected because so many people in the American public are now against his policy, 70% of the young Americans. So he is now facing the possibility of losing elections. And for him, it's time to end this war because He's angry at Israel, not because they killed so many Palestinian children. He's angry at Israel because after 112 days, they failed to achieve anything. I did really want to ask you, I, I thought your point about the three choices Israel had was interesting. And I kind of want to give you the mirror question, which is, you know, at Davos, you've got Secretary Blinken bringing up the two-state solution again, you know, and a lot of, a lot of voices are bringing up the two-state solution again, recycling it. Some Palestinians I've spoken to, um, Nelson Mandela's grandson, are saying, look, 
7th of October showed us that a two-state solution is never going to happen. So now what we need is an anti-apartheid movement. That's, that's it. We need to go for it. Where do you stand? And what are you going to do about these two-state um, voices that are trying to draw everyone back into that? There are two issues here. First of all, I wrote an article in The Guardian on the 15th of May last year on the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, in which I said Israel killed the two-state solution. And I called for a struggle to end apartheid and to end the settler colonial system and to have a one democratic state. It was a very clear article, you can see it. And, uh, but I want to alert you on to one point. We have to always, while we talk about that, we have to always blame Israel for the death of the two-state solution. It's not us who are rejecting it, it's Israel who is rejecting it. And for many, many years, Palestinians accepted that painful compromise of accepting a two-state solution, but Israel killed it. So it's Israel's responsibility. But those who talk about two states are just do it as a lip service, nothing more than that, especially the Americans. If they really meant it, they would say, before they say two-state solution, they would say end occupation and remove the settlements, which they, uh, which, which they also say that are illegal, and then have a two-state solution. But they never mention ending occupation. They never mention removing the settlers. They never mention even stopping the settlement activities. And then they speak about two-state solution. It's just a lip service to cover the fact, the reality, the real position of allowing Israel to kill the two-state solution and just gaining time to finish the process of Judaization of the West Bank. Uh, I, 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 I heard, for instance, the national, uh, the, the, the Secretary of the, um, National Security uh, Secretary, I mean Sullivan, who said he, he described the, the American agenda after the war. He said the first priority is, uh, is uh, to guarantee Israel's uh, security. No, he actually said the following. He described the future as follows. Normalization of the Arab countries, number one. Israel's security, number two. And then a uh, two-state solution. For three years of Biden administration, all they did was to continue the efforts of Trump to normalize between Israel and Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries. They did nothing to, to advance the issue of two-state solution. And when they were asked about it for three years, they kept saying, yes, it's a goal, but it's not time for that. Time is not for that. So in my opinion, it is just a way of avoiding the responsibility. It's a way of avoiding the reality. And it's their way of just giving Israel more time and more time to finish the extermination of the Palestinian people. Uh, look, this Israeli government has very clear plan, which the Americans never opposed. It's what Smotrich said. He said, we will fill the West Bank with settlements and settlers so that Palestinians would lose any hope of a state of their own. And then they would have to choose between one of three options, either to leave, which is ethnic cleansing, or accept a life of subjugation to Israelis, which is apartheid. Or if they resist that, he said they should die which is actually genocide. This has been the Israeli government program. And Netanyahu never said anything about it. I read your 15th of May piece, um, and it was very strong. And I wonder if you, if you stand, it sounds like you stand by that, and I wonder how you see the anti-apartheid movement going forward from here. I am part of it. I am one of the first people who described Israel as an apartheid. Definitely one of the first people. And uh, one of the first people who called for bringing down apartheid, and that what we, what we want is not just ending occupation, but also apartheid. But I am adding to that. Peace will not prevail in this region without ending the Israeli, the Israeli settler colonial character. Without, it's not just ending apartheid. It's ending the settler colonial st structure and the settler colonial system that Israel is using. Um, you have an idea about how to get aid into Gaza. Could you tell us a little bit more about the convoy idea? 
Well, I, uh, knowing that we, we have 30 medical teams working there, uh, I, I, you know I'm a volunteer with Palestinian Medical Relief Society and I founded this organization many years ago. It does wonderful work in Gaza, West Bank and Jerusalem. But in Gaza now we have 30 medical teams that are working under horrible conditions. But they, they are heroic really. They work inside Gaza City. They are the only providers for of treatment now for sick people and uh, besides the hospitals who treat the injured and, and do hospital work and they work jointly together but we lack everything we lack medications we lack food we lack water we lack uh, anesthetics doctors had to operate on people without anesthetics so uh, and and there is lack of water which is leading now to epidemics now we have 400,000 palestinians who are suffering from different diseases including 7,000 cases of hepatitis we could see an outbreak of measles or other dangerous diseases among children because there is no vaccination. So we need immediate aid and uh, we cannot rely on Israel, which is m trying to suffocate Gaza and uh, trying to create genocide through sickness as well. And uh, what gets to Gaza does not exceed 60 to, to 150 trucks in the best day, while Gaza needs 1,000 trucks every day today because of the serious starvation. I mean, f according to the World Food Program, 570,000 people are starving in Gaza. Nine out of 10 don't eat every day. Uh, 50,000 pregnant women do not have proper places to give birth in. 64,000 women are breastfeeding and they don't have food, they don't have milk, they don't have vitamins, they don't have anything. We need to break that siege. And I proposed from the very first days that all the 57 Arab and Islamic countries that met in Saudi Arabia and said they will break the siege to send a convoy, a humanitarian convoy, and include with them WHO, UNICEF maybe, uh, UNESCO, all UN agencies, and break the siege, challenge Israel, raise their 57 flags, bring their representatives. Will Israel bombard? Uh, uh, an international humanitarian convoy that represents 57 countries? I doubt it. But they don't take that challenge. And I demand that they do that because this is the only way to break the Israeli siege on Gaza. All these talks about letting a little bit more trucks, uh, a little bit more aid will not help uh, really eradicate the big problem we are facing today. Um. And I guess that, that brings me to what your assessment is of the approach of the region. Um, how do you think Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey have handled this so far? Well, I, I don't want to put anybody in uh, or everybody in the same basket. Definitely some did what they could and some did better than others. But uh, I talk about the collective responsibility here. And uh, I think in general, the collective responsibility has not been uh, meeting the real needs. And uh, I think we need much more than that. Uh, I, in particular, call for, call for immediate, we're calling for sanctions on Israel. Who should start sanctions? The Arab countries, the Muslim countries. It is not acceptable to have any Israeli ambassador in any country of uh, now, since Israel is accused of committing genocide. So I think they should be the beginners and they, they should be the, in the avant-garde of boycotting Israel. Those countries that normalized with Israel, it is so shameful to keep this normalization while Israel is committing genocide. If it wasn't even Israel, if it was, I don't know, Marshall Islands or, or any other country that is committing genocide, they should not have relations with it. What, uh, w but Israel is killing their brothers, killing their, uh, their relatives and still they are maintaining this unacceptable uh, normalization with, with, with such a country. Um, for the day after, who will run Gaza? What, what does this mean for the Palestinian authority or the Palestinian political structures? What, what should happen the day after? I think this, all this campaign about the next day after, I mean, uh, the, the, all this huge international talk about next day in Gaza is meant to d distract attention and divert attention from the day we live in today. To divert attention from the suffering of the Palestinian people and the war crimes 
that are committed by Israel. Three war crimes in parallel, the war crime of ethnic cleansing, the war crime of collective punishment, and the war crime of genocide. So they want to distract attention. Uh, I don't see Western media people coming to us and talking about what's happening to Gaza. All they ask about is what will happen next. And I have a very simple answer to that. We decide what will happen next. We, the people, the Palestinian people. Uh, we don't, no country in the world has the right to impose patronage on us. Israel will not succeed in its plan of reoccupying Gaza and then bringing a bunch of collaborators from wherever they bring them to run Gaza. This will not work because they will not have any legitimacy in the eyes of the Palestinian people. And Israel tried such an approach before in the West Bank and failed drastically. Shimon Peres tried it when he organized elections of local councils in, in, the, in, in the West Bank, thinking this will bring an alternative leadership. And he was shocked to find that 95% of people who won were uh, Palestinian nationalists. So uh, I, I, I think the Israeli plan will fail. But America has no right to tell us who should govern us. Uh, nobody has the right to tell us who should govern us. We should have democratic free elections. But to get there, uh, we have a very clear proposal uh, as Palestinian National Initiative, which we have told to many other parties. And I think now a, s a very substantial uh, number of political Palestinian parties agree with what we have proposed, which is that we should have national unified leadership immediately, including all the forces without exception. And uh, we should have collective leadership from now on no individualistic relationship, uh, leadership, and uh, nobody should have any monopoly over power. And then we could produce a self, uh, uh, we could produce a national unity interim government accepted by all the political groups to maintain the unity between West Bank and Gaza, to take care of the re re rebuilding of Gaza, as a matter of fact, uh, but most important, uh, this government will be interim and uh, it will prepare for free democratic elections, which we should have had in 2021. And then, had we have these elections, no single party would have gotten an absolute majority. We would have had a pluralistic democratic system, which would have guaranteed the reunification of West Bank and Gaza. This is exactly what we need. But nobody will impose on us who will lead us. And, uh, and, and there is one more important point, uh, since you are asking about that. I don't like this. Sometimes this uh, uh, orientalist uh, approach of some, some Western uh, media people, when they keep talking about a particular person, a single person who could run Palestinians' life, uh, as if they are saying that uh, Arabs or Palestinians can be only run by a dictator. No, we don't need any dictator instead of another dictator. What we need is a collective leadership. And that the best way to achieve that is free democratic elections. Of course, a president can be elected, but we also need to have a parliament and we need an independent judiciary system and separation of powers. Nobody should have full absolute authority over anything. And most important, we need all Palestinians everywhere in the world to participate. Not only those in the occupied territories, but also Palestinians in the diaspora has the right to also participate in electing their leadership through the election of a new Palestinian National Council. It seems to me that the, the Palestinian unity government, the interim one that you discuss, is very possible. Hamas, Fatah are, are saying, let's, get, let's all get together. Um, is this process already happening? Are you starting to, to form? And not yet, not because yet. although some Fatah leaders say it, but the PA is not saying it. And some people at the Palestinian Authority are still trying to impose conditions that are not acceptable, not only to Hamas, but to us as well. So we say unity without conditions, and it would not be a unified national leadership uh, which program will be Oslo that is killed. It has to be a different kind of approach and program, uh, a program that struggles to end occupation and apartheid and achieve Palestinian freedom. Um, just one or two more questions. I wanted to ask about the West Bank. You made an interesting comment earlier. You said the Palestinian Authority is without authority, and you discussed uh, horrible things that are happening in the West Bank. Could you just paint a picture for us about what's happening and what your concerns are? 
West Bank is also under attack. I mean, just one example, since the 7th of October, the Israeli army has arrested 6,000, maybe 100 people. Some were released after being tortured and uh, interrogated. Some were kept in jail. So the total number of Palestinians in Israeli jails from the West Bank is now up to 8,000 from 5,200. There are maybe 3,000 other Palestinians who were kidnapped in Gaza, and uh, some of them are put in a horrible place, concentration camps uh, near Nagab, and one of them is the director of Shifa Hospital, and they are all tortured. Israel is torturing them with electrical shocks, with uh, drowning them in the water, with beating. Uh, we have very horrifying testimonies of people who came from that place. But also in the West Bank, the prisoners now are subjected to terrible treatment. Uh, they are beaten regularly. They have been deprived, tortured with deprivation of food, sufficient food, and, uh, and uh, they have lost a lot, a lot of uh, privileges they had to be before. Uh, and uh, we already lost seven of them who were killed while Israeli soldiers were torturing them inside the prisons. So uh, the West Bank now is reoccupied. Uh, it's like 2002 when Sharon reoccupied the West Bank. There is no city in the West Bank which is not invaded by Israel. And uh, the PA has lost all authorities. I mean, according to Oslo, the PA should be having authority over 18%, which are the Palestinian cities. That's over. I mean, it doesn't exist anymore. They don't even have control of their own revenue, which is our taxes. By the way, the PA, 90% of the budget of the PA comes from people, from us, through our taxes. And only 10% comes from international aid. 90% is controlled, 70% of the 90% is controlled by Israel, and they conduct piracy. Since 2019, as the Minister of Finance told me, Israel is withholding $1 billion of, of the PA money and now they're holding more than 400 additional, so 400 million additional. So uh, the PA is an authority without authority. It's gone a long time ago. Uh, and that's why I don't think there is any reason more to stay, to have any internal Palestinian division, because if it was about the program, Oslo is killed. It's over. Israel killed it. The hope of uh, a program based on uh, compromise with this Israeli establishment is, is finished. So programmatically, there is nothing to differ about. And the, the struggle about the authority is over also because all the authorities are under occupation now. So what we need now is not an authority, but a Palestinian national liberation movement. And are you concerned are you concerned that a war might break out in Lebanon later this year? Sure, I'm very concerned, mainly because of Netanyahu. This man is capable of, bring, of breaking uh, uh, anything, and this man is capable of, of uh, exploding the situation and, and create a huge, terrible war also with Lebanon. Uh, and if he feels that his survival depends on that, I'm sure he will do that, unless the United States really blocks him from doing it. And just the last question, and I don't, I don't want to end on a low note, but we've talked about what should happen. What do you think will happen? We will, we will struggle uh, what will happen. We will, uh, in short, we will overcome. And occupation will end, and uh, apartheid will be brought down. And this whole Israeli settler colonial project will fail. I am sure of that. The issue is not whether this will happen or not happen. It will happen. The question is when will it happen and how much efforts we should make to bring it as soon as possible so that we don't have any victims on anybody's sides, so that no more Palestinians or even Israelis will die, so that uh, we can really achieve the peace that we want, a peace based on justice, and peace based on freedom and not on domination of one side or the other or an oppression of Palestinian people.